Ioannis Cespedes threw a curveball at Mets fans. Tiger Woods is looking good. Which teams will make the top five in the East? We'll give you our picks. The NBA trade that took all the air out of the balloon. Just when you thought the NFL anthem controversy was over. All that and more on What's the 401 Sports coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 411 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. It's good to see everybody today, but we are not going to hesitate. We're going to jump right in. And Mike, you have some NFL talk. That's right, Keisha. Well, of course, the NFL season is just around the corner, and the league is really mired in this national anthem controversy. As expected, of course, Donald Trump has weighed in once again. Keisha, is this saga ever going to end, or is this something that's going to continue to be talked about? Mike, the NFL really just bumbled this from the beginning, and they never seem to be able to get out of their own way. They allow themselves to be, you know, have this situation be hijacked and have the narrative twisted into some kind of alternate reality. And they, both sides have really seemed to dug in their heels on this issue. And I really think it would be in the NFL and its owner's best interest to drop this situation whatsoever and if they don't drop it for any other reason but to do it just to save face because they've allowed themselves to be bullied by the president and those of his ilk i feel as though you would you would want to you know protect your own house and let somebody know that you don't have the right you cannot dictate to us what we should do and technically and i think legally the president cannot meddle in private business affairs. So um, I, I think that they should just stop it because what they've come up with is further going to ostracize the players because you, you notice maybe 10 players not on the field. Oh, then you're going to start taking a little roll call. Oh, this person, this person's not here. Oh, yeah, they're protesting again. So I, I think that if the NFL PA does not win their grievance against the NFL, the conclusion is not going to be in the players' favors, and they are going to be further disgruntled. And I think their pockets are going to be lighter, obviously, if they continue to protest and follow the lead of Tennessee Titan Jarrell Casey, who publicly declared that he was going to protest during the anthem and he was going to pay whatever fines. And also, I'll just wrap up by saying that the the teams have submitted their suggestions on disciplinary actions against any of those their players who choose to protest again during the national anthem. And it's really interesting to note that uh, Miami Dolphins, it was leaked that they were going to suspend players up to four games should they uh, decide to kneel. And my, we spoke about Stephen Ross, the owner of the Miami Dolphins and what his organization does in terms of of fighting um, inequalities and injustices. Um, And also he sits on the, I I believe I have this right, on a foundation that's associated with Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson did say when he was alive that he could not stand for a national anthem for a country who didn't like him. I'm paraphrasing, and but that was the gist of that quote. You know, Keisha, one of the thousand, I'm never one that's going to give Donald Trump credit, but one thing that he has mastered during his presidency is he's been able to deflect attention when negative things are happening to him. For instance, over the course of the last week and a half, specifically a lot of this negative press that he's had with his relationship with Vladimir Putin. And then, of course, the other stuff that's going on here in New York with his lawyer. And what Trump does is when things are not necessarily going his way, when he's getting beaten up in the media, what he likes to refer to as fake news, what he'll do is he'll do something that's going to going to take the attention, the negative attention away from himself, and it's going to rile up his base. And he knows that this is a hot topic that his supporters have been on since day one. I think that this is going to be something that's going to continue for a while. I don't think that this is going to go away. I think that when you have a league where players have been vocal about what they want and and, and the, the, the need for change, and then you have a league that just... Uh, look, if you take it like this, where the people, the, the ones that look the worst here, without a doubt in my mind, is Roger Goodell and the owners, because they have just done flip-flop after flip-flop throughout this whole situation, and it's gotten worse. And here we are where we would like to be talking about the excitement of the Giants and, and what's upcoming for them, and of course the Jets here in New York, we 
these two teams that have made these two changes at the quarterback position and the Giants at the running back position, and we're still talking about the national anthem, which is still a very important issue. And the last thing that I will say is, and I firmly believe this, I think that a lot of these pro anthem people, the ones that are completely against the kneeling, the majority, of course, are white people. I think that they really, it's not about the national anthem. It's that they're against minorities speaking up and standing up for themselves. I really believe that. And I think the last thing that I will say, Donald Trump, I can't imagine that here's a guy who dodged the draft. And I don't want to make this a whole political thing, but here's a guy that wasn't the biggest patriot before his presidency. I don't think he really is so pro-national anthem. I think he's just doing this to stir the pot, and go up against the NFL, and, r- and rally up his base. Yeah, you're right when you're talking about what, how protests are taken or perceived based on who's leading the protest. And I won't uh, belabor the point very much longer, but I remember um, one of my favorite... I'm not a big history buff, but one of my favorite incidents, I don't know why, was the Boston Tea Party. And that was one of the biggest acts of rebellion that our, our, his, our country has seen. And it is celebrated, it is championed. Why? Because it, brought up, it was in your face and it brought about change. But now you fast forward to now and you have the faces behind this protest, be, these protests being mainly brown people, it's not received as much and then we can probably even go back uh, to the civil rights era where protests they were in your face not meant to be convenient and what happened when there were protests there were dogs sick down them water hose tear gas all this stuff so I think that kind of you know I see your point of view when it comes to how protests are uh, perceived by those so we're going to move from the gridiron to the hard courts of the NBA Mike and Heads were shaken when the news broke that San Antonio Spurs traded Kawhi Leonard to the Toronto Raptors for DeMar DeRozan. Now, I will note that there were other players involved in this trade, but those were the two biggest names in it. And DeMar DeRozan and Kawhi Leonard, you know, there were some feelings about the trade. So I wanted to get your um, thoughts on the trade between San Antonio and the Raptors. And also, I wanted to mention in other trade news that Carmelo Anthony is on the move. The Oklahoma Oklahoma City Thunder traded Anthony to the Atlanta Hawks. However, it is being widely reported that the Hawks will buy out Carmelo's contract and then he will sign with the Houston Rockets. So, he, <laughs> and good luck to Carmelo. I mean, I think the, I'll, I'll just start with him. I think, obviously, from my standpoint, I was opposed to the Rockets going ahead and making this move. But I think with the lack of, of moves that they've made this offseason, uh, this is something that could wind up helping them. I know that it's going to be tough to have him and James Carden on the court at the, at the same time when they're two guys that just rely so much on one and one and lack of ball movement. But this is good for Carmelo Anthony, and he has an opportunity now to win it, go to a team that is a championship contender. As far as this Toronto and San Antonio trade, I'll start with um, uh, with Kawhi Leonard. You know, what's that saying? Be careful what you wish for, right? This is a guy that wanted to get traded, and then lo and behold, he goes up and gets one winds up getting moved to a team that he didn't really want to go to. I think that there's a stigma going to Canada, playing for Toronto. Toronto is a great city, but I think as an American athlete, people that grow up in this country, I think still at the same time, when they get moved or they have to go play in another country, even though it is Canada, they're, you know, they're our next door neighbor and everything, I think maybe there's part of that stigma. But also, he had ideas as to where he would go, be it for the short term. And we all know, ultimately, he winds up, he wants to wind up with the LA Lakers. So I felt like karma was served well here because Kawhi Leonard, who from my standpoint was complaining uh, and wanted to get out of San Antonio, well, you got your wish, and now you are now you're off to Toronto, which is actually a pretty good team, and they might have a sh- they might even have a shot to get to the Eastern Conference Finals. As far as Demar Derozan, you know, this is a guy that's really been on the come up. His numbers have really been they've they've been consistent for the course of the time that he's been in the NBA. I know that he wasn't happy the way that all of this played out, but I think for San Antonio, they really made off well here. This is a move that they had to make. They couldn't bring Kawhi Leonard into training camp when it was when it all was said and done so I think both teams really made off well here Toronto this is really a one-year thing because we know that most likely Leonard is not going to stick around in Toronto yeah Toronto was the dark horse in terms of the Kawhi Leonard sweepstakes and um, I remember hearing the the first rumor about Toronto being the mix and I was like yeah okay 
But lo and behold, a couple of weeks after that, I mean, I think it, actually a week after that, here comes the trade. So the San Antonio Spurs had to do this. They had to get this deal done because the longer they waited, the more at more of a disadvantage the situation was going to be towards them because, one, the price would keep going down for Kawhi Leonard in terms of trades. And then also, you, know, you want as much time as you can to get your offense together and, and create this team chemistry. And I would imagine that the longer they waited, um, that might be detrimental to them. And, you know, they got off, Toronto got off pretty easy in terms of what they had to give up to get Kawhi. Because considering what the Lakers wanted and were asking for, and I think that was part of their ploy to make their demands so outrageous that the Spurs weren't going to um, tr- accept the trade and they would just wait till right. free agency. But they, um, you know, Toronto got a pretty good deal. And I will say for Kawhi Leonard in terms of how he feels about this the reports of how he feels have been all over the place because it was Lakers or bust then it was oh he's interested in going to the Clippers because he didn't want to be a Laker with LeBron on the team then it's oh he's not going to resign with Toronto oh well he's kind of warming up to playing but you know it's all over the place and because Kawhi doesn't really speak on his own behalf, it just lets everybody go and run wild. So the Toronto Raptors swung for the fences. They clearly are in a win now mentality because the LeBron Tesaurus, a.k.a. LeBron James, is now living out west. So this might be their time to really make it to the finals of the Eastern Conference and then get to the NBA finals for the championship ring. And if you're going to do it, what a what better player than if obviously LeBron or you know another superstar like that to have on your team than Kawhi Leonard and Masai Ujiri, the general manager for the Raptors, this might be a make or break for him uh, because the he traded away. Um, sorry, he fired the head coach Dwayne Casey after a 59 win season, a number one seed in the Eastern Conference. Now they did get swept by the Cavaliers, but I mean, how many people can say? that they got swept by LeBron James. It's happened. It, he's just that great. Um, so now you replaced the head coach. You got rid of one of your stars and to acquire another who's probably going to be on a one-year rental. So this this might be his last season at, at in Toronto if he doesn't make this happen. Um, and then I'll just end with Carmelo Anthony. You know, I, I am a fan of Melo, so I, I want him to be in the best position that he can find in being um, on a team. I just don't know if the fit is the best with the Rockets, but if nothing else, he's going to make it further in the playoffs than he probably has in his total career or definitely in the past few years. So I, I'm rooting for him, and I hope that D'Antoni can find a way to really utilize him yeah. in the offense. <laughs> Mom, can we get some ice cream? Please, Mom, please. No, we're having dinner soon. Please. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children in foster care who will take you just as you are. Well, Keisha, we move on to the British Open, and of course, legendary golfer Tiger Woods really showed flashes of brilliance over this past weekend at the British Open. For a while, it seemed like Woods, who was among the leaders, it seemed like he was really going to make a push for a milestone win. Did you expect that Tiger Woods was going to make such a remarkable turnaround so soon? I don't know if I expected it. I always hoped. I just never would relinquish the hope that I would see the Tiger of yesteryear, it seems like. And I know that we've talked about Tiger on the show, and I've definitely said that this is going to be a long process. But I find myself getting impatient because I'm like, when am I going to see this Tiger? And I find myself disappointed when I find that he didn't make the cut or he wasn't in the top three because I'm like, how did... The fall was just so steep and so sharp and so fast that I just can't believe that that tiger that we knew is gone in terms of being on the playing field. So I, I'm happy that at, at least at one point during the British Open, he was on 
at the top of the leaderboard. And I'm thinking maybe as he becomes accustomed to winning or, or performing better, it's going to become habit. But I also realize what I what my problem is, is that this tiger is too damn nice. I hear him talk and it's, oh, I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy I did it. No. Where is that tiger? It's like, I'm going to rip your heart out of your chest because I'm going to come. You're going to smell my golf cart dust club smoke. Where is that guy? That guy is going to win majors. And I'm waiting for that guy to come. I don't care if he's liked. I don't care if, you know, they write bad things about him on the bathroom wall in the clubhouse. I just want the mean tiger back. <laughs> I think at this point, I, I completely agree with you. And I think as w with success comes, he is going to get that mentality back. And I think that this is a big momentum swing for him where right now he's proven himself that he can compete. And then going into the last day, last or two days of the Open where he was really at the top. And then, of course, towards the end of the weekend, things started to slip away. One thing that I've seen with Tiger Woods, be it his body presence when he's on camera or also when he's getting interviewed, I think that there is a little bit more of a carefree attitude that's been uh, absent over the course of the last almost 10 years because he's been dealing with so much. When we talk about the issues of what happened with his marriage, all the issues that he had uh, with all those women and everything, and that was a number of years ago. And then, of course, some of these injuries. And also, it's gone to a point of some substance abuse stuff as well. I think at this point, Tiger Woods is comfortable, and I think with what he was able to do at the British Open, I think right now he's probably starting to believe him in himself. We have, what, one more major for this year, along with the Ryder Cup. I'm not sure how that's going to play out, but I think Tiger Woods, I'm much more optimistic on his future and his possibility of winning a major right now, much more optimistic than I was heading into this British Open. I don't want him to be comfortable without winning, without <laughs> not winning. Mean Tiger, come back, please. I need you. Golf needs Mean Tiger. Mike, I've got a quick question for you. In anticipation of the upcoming NBA season, I want to know who are your top five teams in the, in the Eastern Conference as of right now? Well, you got to put the Boston Celtics, Philadelphia 76ers, and Toronto Raptors based on what they've done through the offseason and their play playoff performances uh, from last season, even though we know that the Toronto Raptors were swept. But with getting Kawhi Leonard, that'll keep them in the top five. And then, of course, you know, two teams like the Washington Wizards, and then I think it's almost like a tiebreaker between Milwaukee and Indiana, but I would give the edge to Indiana. So I would say those five teams would wind up being my top five in the Eastern Conference. I'm with you on the first three. I have Boston, Philly, and Toronto. I'm going to put Boston at number one right now as the favorites at the number one slot. Then Philly, then Toronto. But maybe you could switch them. Right. Um, then I have Indiana, and then I have Milwaukee. And I think Milwaukee, this is going to be a very interesting season for them because I feel as though they have consistently underperformed. Um, based on the talent and what the expectations are. And they did trade Jabari Parker, so we'll see. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. We are in a New York state of mind with our New York sports report. Mike, take it away. Well, Keisha, back to the NBA. Sean Marks and the Brooklyn Nets have been busy this offseason, making a lot of deals over this summer. And then, of course, the one that has not gone unnoticed is them trading Jeremy Lin to the Atlanta, the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, Lynn's fans, though, are furious. Keisha, what do you make of this? Do you think that this was a good move for the Nets? And uh, is the complaints from Jeremy Lynn's fans warranted? Mike, I got two numbers for you. 36 and 1. Those are the number of games that Jeremy Lynn played in his first year in Brooklyn and his second, respectively. The best ability is availability, and out of what's that 164 games he spent played 37 total not good enough especially when you are a star point guard and the point guard is one of the most important positions on the court 37 games that's not, that's not even half of the a full a full two seasons so in, you have to cut bait you have to take that salary and allocate it towards someone somewhere else and of course his fans are going to be upset, but that's just part the nature of the game. We talked about trades earlier in terms of Kawhi Leonard and DeMar DeRozan, and uh, we didn't mention it earlier, so I'll just touch on it 
briefly that DeMar DeRozan was very upset about being traded because he felt that um, he was betrayed and thought there was a sense of loyalty. But bringing it back, this, basketball is not in the business of loyalty. If you are uh, the recipient of some sort of loyalty for your organization, congratulations. It's not, um, it's not guaranteed. And when push comes to shove, an organization is going to look out for their best interest. And for the Nets, in their best interest was to get rid of Jeremy Lin, thank him for his services, take that salary and reallocate it towards something now, or keep building cap room for you know seasons to come. Because the long-term health of the Brooklyn Nets, I think, is of their highest priority. I think if you look at Sean Marks and the Brooklyn Nets, you almost second-guessed the decision by going after Jeremy Lin a couple of seasons ago, as you pointed out. Uh, Thirty-eight or thirty, you know, thirty-seven games in the first season, one game he played last year. So it's almost as though you're you're second-guessing the, the the decision. But then you make a positive move by going out and getting rid of this guy. I think that there's no question it was a good decision. Look, the amount of cap space that the Nets are going to be able to to clear up after this coming season has drastically increased. And it's by going ahead and getting rid of some of these guys that Sean Marks has done. I love what they did with the Dwight Howard move. It's going to give them more of an opportunity to go after some some uh, some big names, maybe not next offseason, but the one after that. And the last thing I'll say, you know, Jared Dudley, who the Nets just picked up, um, isn't someone who's given a lot of minutes and really put up a lot of production over the course of the last couple of seasons. But on a team where he could be maybe the eighth guy, maybe seventh, eighth, maybe even possibly ninth guy, he's been in the league for a number of years. He's been a consistent professional. Guys like that are good to p- good pickups, and I, I don't second guess any of the moves that Sean Marks has made this past off season. I think he has the Nets in the right direction. It's still going to be a tough season for them because there's not that much talent. But when you look at the far future, two, three, maybe even four years down the line, I think with moves like he did here with Jeremy Lin, Sean Marks is putting the Nets in a good position. When 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 it, when push comes to shove, the Nets will have some opportunities to go and sign some big time players. Yeah, they're getting rid of cut. Not only are they clearing cap space, but they're also getting draft picks. And when your team is not a hot spot for free agents to to come and sign, one way you build is through the draft. And then also, they can also be part of, um, they can be used as bargaining chips in potential trade deals. So maybe you can get that free agent superstar, or not, I'm sorry, not free agent superstar. If you can get a star like talent, it, by packaging some of those draft picks yeah. and acquire that way. Definitely. Well, Keisha, we move on to baseball where the New York Yankees and Mets just had a two game set because the final game on Sunday night was rained out. They wound up splitting those two games, but for the Mets, things are not looking so good right now. Jonas Cespedes uh, just revealed after the first game of the series that he's going to need surgery on both heels, and this is expected to sideline him for eight to ten months. What do you make of this whole situation with Cespedes and also with the Mets, Keisha? Well, hmm. We'll start with Cespedes and his heel problems. Now, apparently, he's been having these um, heel issues with his heels over the course of time. And it's something that some days are better than others, but I guess for the most part, as until just his recent rev- revelation, he's had more good days than bad. So, and from what I can tell, from what I read, that management, the Mets organization knew this. So, um, I think it's going to be sad that if they lose him, that's quite a bit of time to miss some action. And then you never know what happens when they come back. How, At what level it would he be able to perform? Because your heels are essential. You need them to walk. You need them to run. You need them to stop short, run, fa- you know, run fast, and do twists and turns and everything. You need your heels for that. So um, it will be interesting to see at what capacity he returns. And I'll just say this. The black cat that lives in City Field and where the Mets uh, offices are. I don't, do they have their offices at City Field yeah. too? Mm-hmm. That cat had litters, a, a big old litter of little more black cats because this organization can never really seem to get right. Whether it's by their own hands or just by freak accidents, they just have the worst luck ever. Because not only are, are they dealing with cesspitous probably most likely maybe being out for an extended period of time, 
Thor, Noah Syndergaard, is on the sidelines to hand f do the hand, foot, and mouth disease. I even know, like, <laughs> I was like, that exists? I thought, you know, how do you even get that? Where are you putting your hands, feet, and mouth, Syndergaard? Like, I, I don't even want to know. And then it, it's just injury after another. I mean, this franchise is just the dismal one in New York City, and I don't know what is going to happen to them when they're actually going to get right and stay right for a long, sustained period of time. I was reading an article in The Ringer that says the title was, and part of the premise was, you should give a Mets fan a hug. But they also caution doing so because it's just that bad for Mets fans and Mets organization that you you don't even know if you should give them a hug because they might punch you in the face because then it just brings them back to the fact that reminds them that they're just, the Mets are just a mess, a disaster. <laughs> One of the things that's really surprising about this whole season for the Mets is that they got off to such a great start. You know, their April, they really got off to a nice hot start and it looked like the NL East was up for grabs, which it is because you look at two teams like the Atlanta Braves and the Philadelphia Phillies, where they were not necessarily the favorites to win that division. It was the Washington Nationals, and they've been, you know, um, uh, hovering around 500 baseball throughout the whole season. Uh, with the Cespedes thing, as you pointed out, Keisha, when it rains, it pours, and for the Mets, it's just gotten so dismal uh, over in Flushing, Queens for this team. One thing I'll say, too, is there was a recent poll among sports fans in New York, and they took a poll as far as who were the worst owners for each team. And it was so, it wasn't even a contest the way that the Wilpons <laughs> wound up taking that, uh, taking the number one spot. The next couple of seasons for the Mets, and especially uh, this uh, trading deadline that's upcoming, which we're going to get to in a moment, uh, it's going to be very important for this team. Remember, they were at the World Series just, I think it was three seasons ago, where they wound up losing to the Kansas City Royals. So it's not like success has been that far away from them. But at this point, you know, this team, it's just one thing after another. These injuries have piled up to the point where it's almost as though uh, you have to start feeling bad for them. And now we're going to go off topic and we're going to talk about Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow was dealt a blow on the field because he is out for the rest of the season with a broken hand, but he is winning in the game of life. He has dipped himself in the Miss Universe pool again, and he is dating South African model Demi Lee Nell Peters, who is the current reigning Miss Universe. Tebow said via ESPN producer Charles Moynihan, quote, She is really a special girl, and I am very lucky and blessed for her coming into my life. I am usually very private with these things, but I am very thankful, end quote. That was good news for Tim Tebow, but bad news for us because we have to say goodbye to our friends. But don't worry, you can keep up with us until we meet again next week by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 411 Sports TV. Also, be sure to download and subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcast, Google Play Music, and Stitcher. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us at What's the 411, and we can't wait to see you again next week.